Welcome to Origin, Narratives of Discovery. This event is hosted by TEDxUCR and SciComm at UCR. Both of our organizations share the same goal, to educate our audience. To educate you about the challenges you'll face tomorrow and inspire everyone to make the world a better place. Given the, given the current lack of scientific understanding and communication with COVID-19, we at TEDxUCR have partnered with SciComm at UCR to promote scientific communication. Before we dive into our talk today, we will start off with a short message from our sponsor, CAFE at UC Riverside. So the California Agriculture and Food Enterprise, or CAFE, is a research catalyst initiative here at UCR, facilitating the integrative multidisciplinary study of complex issues associated with agriculture, food, and sustainability for the betterment of the health and well-being of humanity and the planet. You can visit CAFE at their website, www.cafe.ucr.edu, to learn more and download their free brochures. Thank you, CAFE, for your support. And thank you all for finding the time for this event. My name is Rohan Kumar, and I'm the president of TEDxUCR. And my name is Madison Sankovitz, and I am the president of SciComm at UCR. Rohan and I will be your MCs tonight, and we are both so excited to be collaborating on this event together. And we hope that you enjoy the talks from tonight's speakers. As you're all aware, COVID-19 has created confusion. We simply don't know what is going on and who to trust. We lack answers. But what if we could prevent this type of confusion from happening in the future? What if we made sure that future generations don't make this mistake? Well, today, we make sure this doesn't happen. Today, this journey starts here. So the purpose of this event is to understand. Moreover, it is to understand the nuances of science communication and bridge the gap between researchers and the public. And so I'm thrilled to welcome our speakers today, uh, Caroline Hung, Maggie Liu, Mindy Nicewanger, and Stephanie Fine Sassy, each of who, or each one having a unique perspective on scientific discovery. At the end of each talk, there will be a five minute live Q&A session where speakers answer questions from the audience. As our speakers are talking, please feel free to type questions in the comment section to participate in our Q&A portion. So our first speaker for tonight is Caroline Hung. Caroline is currently a second year PhD student in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department here at UCR. Welcome and thank you so much for being here tonight. Hi everyone. So I hope you can hear me and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So just give me one second. Um, allow. Let's see if this works. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see this. And thank you for uh, coming to uh, TED UCR talk today. And I will start my story back to three years ago. And it was the fall of junior year, and I was getting ready to apply to dental school. And I've been interning at the local dentist's office for a while, so this career path seems, you know, all planned out, right? Like, um, I was a third year in college, and people think, you know, I would, was on the right track. But no, I actually felt miserable deep down. I think it's hard to put into words why, but I felt uneasy. And while dentistry would be a stable career path for me, and I would do it for um, all the right reasons, um, I knew I didn't really love teeth or medicine, but at that point I was still trying because I thought switching out of you know the dentistry track or the pre-med track means quitting and giving up. So shifting to the details of a specific day, it was finals week on a Sunday early morning in December of my junior year. And my field partner, Erica, also my best friend and I, took our last chance to complete the fieldwork required for our finals project in geomorphology class. So side note, geomorphology is the study of the formation of landscapes. 
So we were wor working, you know, in the forest around the tri-state point of upstate New York, Vermont, and Massachusetts, and that was where Williams College, our uh, undergrad institution, was located. Sorry. Oh, okay. I was, I was trying to look at the chat. Um, seems like everything is, is good. So um, our goal that day was to find the margin of an ancient glacial lake called Lake Bascom, and it was formed from the melting of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which started to retreat from the New England area about 100,000 years ago in the late Pleistocene. So as the ice sheet retreated, it carved the hills of the region, and it crushed and eroded sediments, creating glacial till. And also the glacial melt uh, created lots of lakes around the area back then. So this is a setup for a region that is actually very prone to landslides due to high water content in these sediments and the high slopes of such hills. So you can begin to see how this setting becomes interesting when it comes to assessing landslide risk. And so that was our goal for the final project. We wanted to locate a few scarps around our college and investigate uh, their slope stability. So really it's just a project to um, work on field measurements and mapping skills as learning geologists. Um, but on that morning, we were pretty stressed out as we walk along the forest grounds just covered in red leaves. And it's not like we had procrastinated up to that point. We actually had spent the whole semester and we found a few smaller scarves um, looking at LIDAR images. So LIDAR is a remote sensing technique that is useful um, for stripping away the vegetation so we can actually see what the landform looks like. Um, but we have not been successful with finding the main major scarp. And so you kind of train your eyes to look at this, but really we're looking at major scarps uh, along the margins of the lake, which is shaded in black here in this map. And so we had scrambled across little streams, we bushwhacked and we got a little muddy, but we still could not find in the field what was described in the literature of a definitive scarp. But we were told by our professor that persistence is key. Um, so something special that day was, uh, it was also the day after my wisdom teeth extraction. So I was in a lot of pain and I was weak from not being able to eat and I was hazy because of all the pain medicine. So I followed along Erica and because of my condition, she had to be the one doing most of the work. Um, she was driving, she was reading the GPS and, you know, leading us. And we hiked around a little bit more and suddenly I think she went, oh, we're really close. And we hiked a little, around a little more and she's go, I think we're almost there. And all of a sudden we came to a stop and there we saw clear as day, a uh, definitive scarp of about 30 feet uh, of an ancient landslide right in front of us. So this picture probably doesn't do it justice, but um, it's pretty cool standing right there in the field. And all the features were there, such as the tall curved um, head scarf on top, the steep slope, and then we found the slanted trees that looked younger than the rest of them around suggesting new growth. And there was also a typical drainage toe, um, which is the lowest end of the landslide depressed over years due to water retention and erosion. So Erica and I, we were excited and we finally found our field specimen. So we started to busy ourselves by measuring the slopes. So we mapped the exact location of the scarp and Erica even climbed on top. So here you can see her leg, um, you know, tr uh, marking GPS waypoints around the lake margin. So future geologists can find this place way easier. So we spent a few hours there doing measurements before calling it a wrap. And I remember super well um, that day on our way back, it was hard moving through all the leaves because they were literally like knee, knee dip deep. And we, we had no idea what was underneath the leaves. So it would be easy to trip on a root over a root or, you know, fall into a pothole. So we were super focused uh, moving and we were staying really quiet. And I remember my mind went through this stream of consciousness, something like, you know, wouldn't it just be nice to keep walking like this in the forest? Like, I don't want to face the pressures of the world um, of my stress, like once we exit. So I want to just keep walking like this. So, you know, I'm thinking, and all of a sudden I heard rustling far away and my glaze followed to where the noise came from. And I saw, you know, instantly two huge German shepherds running at full speed towards us. So I go, Erica, run. And at that point, we were probably still like five minutes walking speed away from the car. And so we re started running, like adrenaline pumping. And like in that moment, we no longer care about tripping under the leaves or like the hills. Like it's like really our fight or flight instinct carrying us being hunted by the dogs. And so we got to the car in what felt like seconds and we slammed the door shut just in time before the heads of the dogs followed us in. So we were kind of like yelling in relief and we caught our breath. And the dogs continued to circle around us before running off. And Erica and I, we were so relieved um, because even though most people would say, well, they are dogs, like they probably just wanted to play. 
But I think if you know you were in that moment, um, I bet you wouldn't be so sure because as much as we know, we may, we may have trespassed someone's property, and these growling dogs really did not look friendly. So after the whole experience, we drove back to our dorms in silence, and we were both still recovering from the shock. And I even forgot the pain from the wisdom teeth surgery. And so later, while I took a shower, I suddenly had an epiphany. And it goes, you know, dentistry would never be right for me. I think I was born to be an earth scientist. Um, how could be my world be a patient's mouth in a tiny cubicle with no windows when I have experienced all of this? And when every time I do field work, it kind of turns into a grand adventure. And even though as a geologist, I would be giving back to our society in ways that may be um, heard of, you know, little, little heard of, but like if I enjoy doing it, then who cares if people ask, like, what are you doing bent over there like that, all getting all muddy and your face inches away from the ground? Like I knew I had a natural inclination for rocks, for fossils, um, for past landscapes. And this journey was only at its beginning for me, but I was for the first time in my life um, excited. And I had been afraid of the world because I was trying so hard to pretend to be, you know, someone that I am not. And to exist like that every day felt like a marathon. So being chased by dogs helped me see, you know, how important the thrill is to me. And it helped me bust the cycle that, you know, I think a lot of us students or early career scientists get stuck in. And so when I finally faced my own truth that I want to be a nurse scientist and I want to do research and field work after college, like, you know, I want to teach maybe after grad school, I became ready to go after it. And I think the idea finally, just to able to accept the truth for myself, uh, kind of transcended my entire being. Um, I was simply happy and that elation was really powerful. So time flies and, you know, that day I had an epiphany, it was already three years ago. And what have I done since then? So I finished my undergraduate degree and applied to graduate school. And I have traveled to some really amazing places to do field and lab work. And that list includes New Zealand, France, and Russia. And I also lived in really cool places to do research. So I spent four summers in Mystic Seaboard in Mystic, Connecticut to do maritime science uh, research. And I've been so lucky to have explored um, the coast and the mountains of a lot of places. And so here I am, 23 years old, and I'm talking to you as a second year doctoral graduate student at UCR in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department. And so for my main project for the dissertation, I study the biogeochemistry of the Salton Sea, which is California's second largest lake straddling um, Riverside and Imperial counties. So Salton Sea is a very accessible place for us to do work. It is actually just located 2.5 hours drive west uh, east away from UCR, just south of Coachella and Palm Desert area, um, and also south of the Joshua Tree National Park. And the current flooding of the Salton Sea Basin was actually a human caused perturbation because the lake was accidentally created in 1905 when a flood in the Colorado River breached the levees originally built for freshwater irrigation. Um, however, with changes in irrigation policies all the way upstream from the Colorado River in the 90s, um, Salton Sea has become a terminal lake, drying rapidly at one foot per year, according to the USGS. And the depth of the Salton Sea is currently about uh, 40 feet. So you can imagine even with changes in hydrology and such, um, the Salton Sea may not longer be there, um, at least a century from now. So as for fuel work, because of the drying of the water, um, rapid drying, the docks originally made for launching boats are now all virtually useless. So it was quite a headache for us to figure out how to launch a research vessel into the water. And so originally we used a, a kayak, but we you know, forgot that fact that the Salton Sea is literally the surface area of 2 million football fields. So like we were paddling in for like 30 minutes, so we didn't get anywhere. Um, so we finally streamlined the Zodiac and outboard approach. So we carried this inflatable boat past like the muddy, like that would sink us. Um, and we can actually now traverse the lake and go to the center of the lake and conduct field work. And really there are two major overarching things that guides my research questions and methods. And the first is how would the biogeochemistry of the lake change as water levels continue to decrease and the salt content increases. And the bottom portions of the lake are already not oxygenated, which is the cause of massive ecological die off. And so would these anoxic portions extend or decrease with the shallowing of the, uh, of the lake in the future? 
So we are doing field work actively each month to measure the dissolved oxygen, the oxidation reduction potential, salinity, temperature, and a lot of other important um, chemical parameters to see the seasonal and spatial variations um, in the stratification or uh, the layering of the lake. And the second thing is that with the drying of the uh, Salton Sea, the lake beds, uh, the pesticides and trace metals that have accumulated in the bottom sediments would be exposed to wind and transported around as toxic dust to nearby communities. So this toxic dust is dangerous to public health and the quality of life for surrounding communities. Um, for example, 20% of adolescents in the region are estimated to have asthma compared to 8% national wide. So our goal is to characterize the spatial distribution of toxic trace metals and bottom sediments, acknowledging the fact that you know, the Salton Sea is, is a dynamic system, the concentrations will be changing, and that these trace metals are likely to be mobilized into the water column um, once the lake shallows and somehow the water column gets oxidized. So we want to identify a critical depth level that should be kept wet um, in the Salton Sea in future remediation scenarios such that we can prevent um, the exacerbation of toxic dust problems. So really reme remediation scenarios are going on, but we're going to be the one who are doing the scientific research underneath to make sure that we're doing things that are gonna be um, efficient and effective um, to, to keep the Salton Sea uh, wet, essentially. And so as always, field work is full of surprises. My field partners and I have went through quite struggling times at first to launch our Zodiac because none, none of us are experts in boating. Um, and we also were, there was a time where we tried to make it back, you know, on the water racing before sunset. That's so that was quite, quite scary. And also we've been out several times in the summer under triple digit weather for like five hours. Um, and it was, it was really hard. But nonetheless, we are slowly get, getting our data. And I'm happy to report that I still find field work thoroughly just like I did three years ago. And I think field work is more than just data. It's, you know, the process of data collection and observations can really influence our scientific results, our interpretations, and the future direction of research. But also to me, field work is a, a greater, is a big like place where I make um, human connections. And so at this point, you might wonder and go, you know, why, why do we take such a roundabout uh, way since the beginning of the talk to bring us to this point? You know, talking about my, my most recent research. But the simple message I want to convey for this talk is the idea that, you know, don't undermine your process. Uh, like the days where you sit in your room or at like a coffee shop or like at work, you know, just studying, like applying to jobs or opportunities and like worrying and thinking about the future. Because I think that is an important part of the journey. And that is persistency, like the showing up every day part. But when there is a flame, like an opportunity to put yourself out there, do not snuff it out. Like when an opportunity comes, maybe offer yourself completely, follow your heart, even if the outcome is uncertain and could be scary. Um, and even the research you are doing now or the classes you're taking now or the job, um, you may not be directly relevant to your dreams. Um, don't stop trying because like what you get out of it may just surprise you. And I gotta be honest, I think the arc of my storyline uh, for this talk uh, probably is similar to a lot of people. It's so like I recognize a problem in my life. Um, I followed, um, followed by, you know, a climax or like a realization. And then my life ensued. And I know nowadays when you apply to big fellowships like the NSF GRFP, the reviewers are peeling their eyes for the most unique story. But I want to say one of my story was just simply about a girl that really loved nature and then compassionate and loved the idea of sustainability. Like, what if I feel like my love for the sciences is greater than the setbacks, like, you know, me being an immigrant? And like, can we value and create a space in our narrative, you know, each of our narrative for the special little moments that sometimes means the most but are often overlooked? Like for me, when I met my best best friend for life in my first earth science class, or like when my former advisor and I cel celebrated a successful field day in a fish and chips shack in the middle of nowhere, rural New Zealand. But I figure if I will tell you exactly what happened, and I hope by being vulnerable, I will speak my best truth. And I believe in the power of words and want to come carefully convey exactly how I felt. So much like about what truly drawn me to the earth sciences and the passive research. 
And in days, I think it's how the people and the institution made me feel. And what is daunting about going to grad school or academia for many people, I think, me included, is the idea of why and how can somebody persist for so long in a never-ending cycle of grant writing and rushing to publish at conferences and um, peer-reviewed journals. But I want to say this journey, at least to me, is about persistence. And persistence to me is defined as chasing the thrill, even though I know situations uh, can become really difficult and maybe even boring. But even if I become bored, I know that my self-efficacy defined broadly as my actions, no matter how small or big matters, that I have the urgency to choose my perspective. And on bad days, you know, I draw from the inspirations during my initial experiences with fieldwork, maybe my so-called honeymoon period with fieldwork with the earth sciences, when you know everything was new, um, that projects were at low stake, and I was just going high off the throw of discovering that I kind of pushed myself forward. So this year, we all know um, the pan pandemic has slowed down my research timeline, and I know of many people's. And what I enjoy most about school is the social interaction, you know, has been entirely removed. But in these challenging times, I think um, often back to three years ago when I made my decision, and it's just like the metaphor. Um, for the for, for the forest leaves I described early in my narrative. Like, yes, we were so careful, you know, Erica and I going slow and trying not to fall, not to mess up, because what we cannot see what's underneath. But when we were when we were chased by dogs, you know, forcing to go super fast, we still ran with our instincts and we didn't fall. And so I think following my heart to be an earth scientist is just like that. I still cannot see where I'll be in the future. But I know running with this ambition is the only way. And like here, I would urge you to chase and embrace that moment, like when the day-to-day -day mediocrity adds up and turn into something way more, way more interesting. So I often overthink, and I know many of my friends do too. So if you're asking yourself all the valid questions of, you know, why am I here? Why am I pursuing STEM? Um, why grad school or academia? How much money will I make after my degree? Like if I don't want to stay in academia, et cetera then stop and ask, do I really like what I'm doing? Am I growing as a person along with my scientific knowledge and ambitions? And does this research make me happy even if I'm not in the top of my field? And I hope the answers to those questions could justify you know, to your brain like why you're following your heart and just maybe give you a deep sense of peace that you will be okay even if the future of your career is ambiguous. So embrace that overthinking because I believe with our collective stories, um, we can manifest great things under the name of science. So thank you, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your valuable insight, Caroline. We will now be entering a Q&A portion. So um, feel free to submit any questions you might have down below in the chat bar, and then we'll read it out. So the first question is, this is from Melody. Um, what inspired you to join the Salt and Sea Research? Yeah, so um, when I got here, I was actually way more interested in sort of ancient, like studying the uh, ancient times in geology, but my advisor quickly points me towards a cool project that's happening nearby where I can literally do field work um, just a two hour drive. And I got to the Salt and Sea and I realized how huge um, how huge the lake is but like also it's if you ever go um it really is a big you know environmental wasteland and like actually the Salton Sea had a you know history of it was like a vacation spot in the 50s and you know gradually as you know changes in water irrigation policies um it became a terminal lake so it's evaporating really fast and there's no inflow coming in so all the fish that are dying off people no longer go there and it's like probably the biggest lake in you know the U.S. where there are no boats and stuff. So I began to be like, oh, I, I really want to study this. I really want to, you know, be the person who puts, puts a water vessel in there, um, so we can actually do field work again in the Salton Sea and actually tackle the most, you know, the problems that most needed to get tackled um, for for policies to be inputted um, for remediation efforts. Yeah. Okay. So you think part of it was like the distance and the fact that it was like an undiscovered area at the time. Yeah, I think most of, um, a lot of the Salton Sea research stopped in early 2000s because most people couldn't get a water vessel into it. It's just like how fast the water's receding. Like none of the maps that exist right now are actually that accurate because it's drying super fast.
changing career path so late and how did that change your passion slash drive in your um, studies? Well, so it wasn't that scary because I had already declared a biology major. So I think I was just adding up on geosciences because remember I was doing pre-med. So like, it's like one of those nice things about pre-med is that it's like really easy to transition because like um, you end up getting in the prerequisites done for every field. So I actually thought it really worked out because um, like after taking chem classes and physics classes, um, it really helped me get ready for grad school in the sense that if I had just started out knowing my path and I took the, all the right classes, um, you know, like I wouldn't have been exposed to so many things. And to me, um, science is very interdisciplinary, it's multidisciplinary. Um, so yes, it was scary, but like, um, I, I think the most important thing was I had really good mentors and I had really good friends who supported me. And knowing that, you know, science is multidisciplinary, I knew I was able to catch up. Okay, uh, thank you. And then the next question is from TEDxUCR. Um, what advice would you give to someone looking to pursue a similar career in earth science? Um, I would say <clears throat> definitely try to um, go out and explore as much as you can. Um, there are field trips available if they're, you know, anything available to you, like field camps, uh, definitely go and try and pursue it. Actively ask, ask your professors or the grad students you know, um, or your grad advisors, undergrad advisors, um, what you can do. Because um, something like geology I knew, like when I was learning in the classroom, like it was interesting and all, but once I got into the field, it was like, it was incredible. It blew my mind. And it was so much easier to learn what things are in the field compared to like textbook. Like, you know, you hold out a rock and you're like, um, well, I, I mean, when you're in a field, you get more amazed by it than learning about just the mineralogy in a textbook, I would say. Um, so um, that's my advice is to, to go explore and see, see as much as you can. That's great. Um, and the next question is from <laughs> no, we're, we're just waiting. Yeah, and one thing I'm really lucky about was um, I think I I was able to like find research positions really early on in my undergraduate career, and that was to me all pure luck because um, I wasn't the one who got the best grades in an undergrad, and I and I wasn't like you know if I applied to any you know jobs, I don't think I would get selected, but. For some reason, I just landed a really awesome research position, and that really opened my eyes up. Good, Sam. This is the last question. Uh, this is from Matthew Chan. Um, what can we take away from your research at the Salton Sea? Um, so, so the Salton Sea is kind of a beast to tackle because the phenomenon that we're studying is um, only in the late summer, so um, late August, early September. And so when we go out there, like, it's literally a struggle to survive. Like, it's, you know, 115, like, degree Fahrenheit weather, and um, you're under the sun for five hours. Um, so one thing to take away is that you really need to take care of your body, um, but also, like, know that you can do it, and, like, you can really, like, learn how to plan out each detail of your field work. And I, this is something Mindy will talk a lot about later, too. Um, when she goes to Antarctica, uh, but but yeah, you have to trust your teammates, uh, the people in the boat with you. Um, you have to plan out exactly the protocol of your research, and you're not wasting any time. Like you don't want to be wasting any time. You don't want to be figuring out things when you're on the water under that weather. Um, and also, what what I can take away is is really persisting because a lot of the questions that we want to answer, um, there's no there's no direct way to it. You kind of use your imagination, use your creativity to come up with ways you'll sample. So um, I guess one thing to take away is you, you got to be ready to solve problems just like that. Okay, I think I have time for one more. This is from Chen Min Hung. Um, is there anything we can do to reduce the toxic dust at the salt and sea? Yeah. Um, yeah, so as my advisor, Tim Lyons, would always say, well, we got to keep the salt and sea wet. Like, we can't, you know, like, 
an uh, example would be Owens Valley, Owens Lake, um, and it, it dried up and, you know, the dust going to fly around. So, you know, we got to keep it wet. And, you know, there's talks about, you know, putting in like either fresh water or seawater. Um, but, but that's going to take a lot of, you know, there's ethical questions and that's, that's going to take a lot of money. So I think I personally think a good way is to make it turn it into a wetland and also start trying to like filter out or monitor the inflow of like agricultural agricultural wastewaters that go into the salt and sea so like you're literally like limiting the amount of toxic trace metals and pesticides going in and you're also keeping the water wet by turning it into some sort of wetland where the sediments are 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 wet and moisturized okay so that wraps it up for our first q a portion Again, thank you, Caroline, for speaking at our event today. And now let's move on to our second speaker for the event, Dr. Maggie Liu. Dr. Liu is a research fellow of machine learning and cosmology at the University of Nottingham, where she teaches a master's course on machine learning in science. Hello, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak on this platform today. I'm Dr. Maggie Liu and I'm a research fellow at the University of Nottingham where I teach machine learning and work on research relating to astrophysics and cosmology. I've been fascinated about space and astronomy since I was a very young age and the more I learn about it, the more I want to learn. But there's so much information um, that we're gaining every day and it's kind of inevitable that machines are taking over our analyses. So in this talk, I'm gonna be talking about humans versus machines in making the big discoveries in our big universe. So I wanna start here. This is the late 19th century where astronomers used telescopes like this one, um, where they would lie on that little bench there observing the night skies. This particular uh, telescope is the Sydney Star camera at the Red Hill Observatory, and it's in the UK. And it was one of the uh, telescopes, one of the many telescopes all over the world that were involved in creating the first astronomical sky survey. And to record these stars, it predates your digital cameras and even exposure films. In fact, um, in those days, people were using um, things like this. This is called a photographic plate. It's made out of glass and that is what they use to process their astronomical data on. So when I talk about astronomical data, this is what we're talking about. Um, each of those little dots there are stars in our galaxy. And in order to make our astronomical catalog, our um, essentially map of the sky, we would have to draw a grid over these photographic plates and then by hand and by rulers measure where these stars were occurring. And um, all this analysis was done by computers, which in those days um, were actually women just like this one. Um, the photographic plate that I showed you was part of one of those um, astronomical surveys that I was talking about and they were 16 by 16 centimeters and that particular one at that observatory in Perth had 11 women computers um, analyzing the data over um, over 10 years but some great discoveries have been made using this method for example this um, on the left there, you see a, an example of a photographic plate where the arrow is pointing to an object, which several days later that you can see on the right, the same uh, measurement on the sky, that object has moved to where the new arrow is pointing. And that discovery is that of the planet Jupiter. It was done by eye and humans just had to somehow spot the difference in these images so you can imagine how difficult it was. For the first astrographic um, catalogue they used 22,000 photographic plates just like the one I showed 
and they managed to catalogue 4.6 million stars. That's pretty impressive, except we know there are many, many more stars out there. And thanks to space telescopes such as ESA's Gaia mission, this is an example of um, all the stars that they have measured. And um, to date, Gaia has mapped 1.7 billion stars in our Milky Way. But this is less than 1% of the stars that we think exist in our galaxy. Here we're seeing the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's a patch on the sky less than, uh, much smaller than the size of the moon. But here there are 10,000 galaxies. This is a tiny fraction of the estimated 100 billion galaxies thought to exist in our universe. Today, many of these detections are still made by scientists by hand. And as you can expect, it's an extremely slow process. For example, there are many examples of people spending their entire PhD trawling through images just like this one. This is the surface of Mars. And as part of their thesis, they would have to count the craters, measure their diameters, and just analyze the impact history in order to learn about the age of, our, of the planet Mars and of our solar system. To be honest, I can't imagine a more boring PhD, but some great discoveries have come from methods just like this one. For example, um, this is Jocelyn Bell Burnell, and she, during her PhD, trawled over tons and tons of data just like this one, and it looks a lot like noise. But in the lower image there, you can see a light, you can see some radio data where you see some dips. And those dips show the first detection of a pulsar, a highly magnetized rotating star. It would be fantastic if we could continue to use talented PhD students such as this to explore the astronomical observations that we're obtaining. But to be honest, it's not a great use of their time and it's just not very efficient. So it would, this is kind of the data that we're collecting over these years for different survey missions. And by 2037, we expect to be obtaining three zettabytes of data. That's 3000 million terabytes of data. One option to tackle this is known as citizen science. So this is employing the help of the general public. This could be people of all backgrounds. They could be plumbers, they could be hairdressers. They can be of all ages, young or old, to help um, tackle this trawling through data to find discoveries um, of our universe. And this is, an, this is an example of what my student did as part of his master's thesis. He created a citizen science project where people would look at images of here galaxy clusters and help us identify which are actually galaxy clusters or which are black holes or other artifacts by answering simple questions such as this one. Another such example is this. This was part of an exoplanet finding uh, project, citizen science project. And here you've got a light curve. So it shows the light of a star, um, how it changes over time. And those dips, those periodic dips, is kind of what you expect when a planet moves in front of a star. However, this one is a bit more peculiar because the duration of those uh, dips are very different. They dip to different um, depths and they don't occur very periodically. And so this is actually a very peculiar object known as Tabby Star. And no one really knows what's causing this and it's, speculated that what could be causing it 
is a alien civilization that has built this kind of mega structure of solar panels to harvest the energy from their star. That's just one crazy theory, but that's one of the best that they have at the moment. So that's great, but humans to classify things like spiral or elliptical galaxies, even on data such as the Rubin Observatory that we saw earlier, would take 120,000 years to do so. So as you can expect, it's not very efficient. Um, when SKA comes along, we definitely need to look for more robust methods, such as relying on machines, which could do this in hours and would be much better than humans because humans get tired after about 20 minutes and they're not consistent in their analysis methods whereas machines always are. But when I say machines, I don't want to scare you. People typically think that machines will take over our world or whatever. Um, when I talk about machine learning, um, I just think something very simple. Um, I'm going to give you a 101 on machine learning. And the idea is that if we have some input data, like we have on the left, 3.5 and 3, we just want to learn a mapping to some other data, output data, the 1 and the 0 um, on this screen. And so if I were to tell you the function that maps those input data to the output data, let's say it's to multiply by some weights, W, and to add some biases, B, then you should be able to work out that the weights, um, the W, is equivalent to 2, and the B is equivalent to minus 6. But instead of those numbers, typically what we're interested in is visual stuff, for example, images of cats and dogs, and then classifying them into those categories, labels, cat or dog. And generally, there's more than one function. It usually looks complicated like this, but that kind of breaks it down from those weights and biases. You've just got many functions and many parameters that you're trying to optimize to get from some image to some label. This is the most simplest and one of the old, oldest machine learning methods known as an artificial neural network. And um, it's a very basic method. But that's the gist of machine learning. It's not conscious. It's not anything that could run away and take over the world. But with some more complex architectures, we can do some stuff like this. This is some research I've been working on. And this is detection of um, infrared stellar bubbles in infrared data on the sky. And so those bubbles are created by the huge energies released by um, stars in their early ages. And they're typically done by eye, but with methods like machine learning, you can see that over time it improves and gets better and better at detecting these objects. Apart from that, we can use machine learning to do um, clustering. So here we've got an example where we've got two types of galaxies. Any human can simply see that. And using machine learning, we can easily sort these into two groups. And even humans can do that. But here's the challenging part. For a machine, if you introduce a new galaxy like this one, and you didn't tell the machine that you had a third type of galaxy, it would be difficult for the machine to know where to sort this galaxy. But for humans, for us, it's very easily distinguishable from those two other types. The machines, it's difficult to do this, especially if they don't know how many types there are out there. And this is a particular example. This is known as the cosmic snake. This is a really interesting object. There is a type of machine learning known as active learning, where we can use machines to 
where we can use machines to identify the most interesting objects out there and then use humans to confirm if they really are as interesting as they seem. And this is a much better use of our time and theirs. So we're joining together the machines and the humans to make better data analyses. So this is particularly important for cases like this, uh, where what we're seeing here are satellite trails by SpaceX's Starlink satellite. And these are mega constellations of internet satellites that are just noise to us. We as astronomers aren't interested in them. But if you were to use machine learning, you might identify these as interesting sources where as humans, no, they're not. Noise, instrumental effects, and other things like that can pose as anomalies in our data that, that machines find interesting. So overall, I think I managed to convince you that machine learning is super powerful. We can use it for object detection. We can use it to classify sources of objects. This is an example from my own research of detections of galaxies, stars, and cosmic rays. And also to simplify complex theoretical models. But in order to really make the most out of our data, we can't do it without humans. So really, we need to combine the efforts of humans versus machines. I know I started my talk off talking about humans versus machines, but we need both humans and machines in order to make the biggest discoveries in our universe. Thank you very much for listening. All right, Dr. Liu's talk has been pre-recorded today due to the international time change. So we will unfortunately not be having a Q&A portion, but thank you again, Dr. Liu. And we will now be having a short message from our sponsor, Blue. Blue is a mobile app that introduces me up to 150 feet. Simply put, it turns my smartphone into a two-way beacon that connects me with everyone else. All I have to do is turn it on, slide it back in my pocket, and I'm good to go. You see what just happened there? We just exchanged social networks. It was that easy. Blue lets me passively exchange social networks. I no longer have to ask friends one by one for their social media profiles while losing the chance to meet someone new. Blue does that for me, and it creates a record of who I've met and who I've talked to. Even though everything is automatic, Blue puts me in control of what information I want to share. The best part about Blue, it uses Bluetooth low energy, so I don't have to worry about it draining my battery or not having signal, allowing me to connect with everyone, everywhere, anywhere, and anytime. Finally, physical and digital connections come together with a simple, useful, and friendly solution that helps you build relationships that last. Thank you, Blue, for your continuous support. We will now move on to our third speaker for this event, Dr. Mindy Neiswanger. Dr. Neiswanger is a postdoctoral fellow at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me today. So what do you want to be when you grow up? This is a question that we have all been asked multiple times throughout our childhoods. For me, there was never any hesitation. I wanted to be a scientist. In fact, when this question was posed to me during high school graduation, I wrote, work for NASA or the national government, become a tornado chaser, and one day go to Antarctica to study the climate and weather of the world. Well, 12 years later, I have done two of those things. I have yet to chase a tornado though. This is the story of me accomplishing my dream of conducting research in the coldest, driest, and windiest place on earth, Antarctica. But first, let's take a moment to describe how I even got to the position of being asked to go to Antarctica. I grew up in Texas. My parents had divorced when I was 10, and I was supported by my amazing mother. I was the first person in my family to graduate college when I did just that in 2013 from Texas A&M University with a major in meteorology or atmospheric science. While at A&M, I became really interested in geology and the past climate of Earth after taking a historical geology course as an elective. 
Many of my peers were joining organizations and taking internships, which could benefit their future career options. But I worked nearly full time at a local fast food restaurant to financially support myself. So that greatly limited the internships and opportunities I could take. And by the way, if we really want to diversify science, we need all internships to be paid. But that's another speech for a different time. Anyway, I found a really great opportunity called an REU, a research experience for undergraduates, after heeding the advice of a fantastic professor and mentor at Texas A&M. REUs are a paid eight to 10 week long research program funded by the National Science Foundation. I applied for several of these programs and was accepted into the UC Irvine Earth System Science 2012 REU program. My research topic, ice core trace gases. So what are ice cores? Ice cores are cylindrical samples that we drill out of the polar ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, as well as high elevation mountain glaciers. These cold regions form a unique type of ice, an ice that cannot be formed in our at-home freezers. Basically, as snow falls year after year in these very cold places, it doesn't melt, but rather accumulates and slowly compresses. And as that snow compresses, it turns into what we call ice. But trapped inside that ice are tiny air bubbles of the ancient atmosphere. And so we can actually look at these air bubbles through time and see what was in our atmosphere. In the UC Irvine Ice Core Laboratory, the air is removed from the ice core samples and analysis is done to measure the amounts of different gases. The same type of research is how we know the amounts of carbon dioxide and methane, the very potent greenhouse gases, in our atmosphere for the past 800,000 years. In the UC Irvine lab, we were looking at gases that are 1 million times less abundant than carbon dioxide, what we call ultra trace gases, or gases that are found in very small amounts in the atmosphere. These gases are interesting because they can inform us about different cycles in the Earth system like how many plants there were on land through time, or how wildfires varied through time. After my summer at UC Irvine, I was hooked and decided to apply for graduate school. I will admit that in college, I had absolutely no plans to attend graduate school because I honestly didn't even know what it was. I call this the first generation bubble. But lo and behold, I was accepted back into the Earth System Science Department at UC Irvine for graduate school to work with ice cores. And just a few months into my first year of the program, I found out that my advisors had been funded to drill a new ice core at the South Pole, and they would need somebody to go into the field to help with this project. I was first on their list. My dream was coming true. I was going to go to Antarctica for a full three months. There's quite a bit of prep work to travel and work in Antarctica. First, you must be physically cleared to go, meaning you have to have lots of blood work taken and medical exams to ensure that you're healthy. Then there is the packing. What in the world do you pack to go to Antarctica? The US Antarctic program would provide me with some extreme cold weather gear, like a jacket and boots, but what about all the other things I would need over the course of three months? It's not like there's a target at the South Pole that I can just run out to if I forget something. Like the planner I am, I began packing a whole month before departure. I laid out everything I could think I would need and then some. In the end, I did pack way more than I needed, but I was happy I had lots of chapstick and lotion with me. Antarctica is truly the driest place on earth and it does a number on your skin. The travel to the South Pole is an epic adventure of its own. It takes roughly five days of traveling with a few stops along the way. For me, I had an eight hour layover in Sydney, Australia, which allowed some time for exploration, like the big sites, like the Harbor Bridge and the Opera House. And then I was off to Christchurch, New Zealand, where I would get all of my extreme cold weather gear. This jacket here is called the Big Red, and it's the warmest thing you could ever wear, but it's also pretty bulky, as you can see in the picture. But it, def it definitely keeps you warm when it's minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit outside. That's a minus six zero. After getting geared up, it was time to head to Antarctica. We flew a US Air Force C-17 into McMurdo Station, one of the coastal bases maintained by the United States. These military planes are incredibly loud, and as such, you must wear protective earplugs. 
Another difference with flying with the military is that passengers are actually allowed up into the cockpit as we were flying over Antarctica. I got to actually see my first glimpse of the continent I had always dreamed about from the cockpit. Once in McMurdo, we waited for good weather before we boarded a different US Air Force plane, a C-130 Hercules, that would take us to our final destination, the South Pole. When we arrived at the South Pole in mid-November, the location where we were going to drill into the ice to collect the South Pole ice core, also called the Spice Core, was just a, few, was just a flag on the plateau. The first few weeks involved the Spice Core team, myself and 10 others, and crew members of the South Pole Station digging into the snow and building the tent, which would protect us from the elements and house the mechanical drill. Here are some photos of us getting the tent and everything set up. There was a lot of digging and moving snow. Eventually, everything was set up and ready to go. This is a view of our, our site from a plane. And on December 8th, 2014, we successfully drilled into the ice sheet at the South Pole and brought up our first six uh, foot section of ice core or two meter section. The upper portion of the ice sheet is mainly just compacted snow and it takes several meters below the surface before we reached what we consider bubbly ice or the ice that has the bubbles of ancient atmosphere inside. We were so excited when we got to that point because as a trace gas scientist, this is the ice we were looking for. At the South Pole, we reached this bubbly ice depth at about 400 feet below surface. We worked six days a week and about 10 to 11 hours a day, so it definitely wasn't a vacation. The temperature in the tent where we spent most of that time was always well below freezing, usually around zero degrees Fahrenheit. My job was to ensure that the ice core samples were measured, labeled, and packaged safely so that they would make their journey back to the United States. It's important to know the depth the ice came from because that is how we determine the age. So I got exceptionally good at math in the cold. For reference, here's our logbook. Each time the drill went back into the ice sheet to pull up more ice, it would take longer and longer. Eventually, the time between the drill runs, as we call them, became so long that, um, whoops, that I had to uh, occupy my time somehow. I actually skipped some photos here. Anyway, these are the pictures of all the ice packed up. And this is the ice making its way back on the plane uh, to head out to McMurdo Station. So each time the drill went back into the ice sheet, uh, it took longer and longer between these runs. And so I had to occupy my time somehow. And sometimes the time difference between when the ice came up could be anywhere between 45 minutes to over an hour and a half. And so I occupied my time a lot of times by reading. And so in this picture, the white wall behind me is snow. And the box I'm sitting on was the heated glove box. So it was the best place to take a break. We did actually have an indoor heated break room, but it gets pretty exhausting after a while taking clothes on and taking clothes off. For reference, here's what my normal daily routine was getting dressed to go outside. So you can see I put on multiple layers of clothing. The South Pole Station is an amazing place. In terms of field work, it's a bit posh. We actually sleep indoors in a heated building at night, and there's so many activities to take part in. There were roughly 150 people at the station, all with unique backgrounds and personalities. I really got involved with the volleyball team, and near the end of the three-month season, I was playing volleyball about three or four times a week in the evenings. Antarctic field work typically lasts from November to February, and you'll know that there are many holidays during that window of time. The station puts on a fabulous feast for both Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I also celebrated Hanukkah with several of the folks I met at the pole. Another fun event that happened for me is my birthday. I turned 24 in 24 hours of daylight, by far the best birthday I've ever had. Another perk of working in extreme cold environments is the food. You need calories to stay warm, so when you're in a really cold place, you have to eat more food. So we ate all types of yummy treats. 
by the end of the three months of munching on Oreos, I can tell you that I actually don't really enjoy them much anymore. In February, it was time to start packing up and preparing the ice core drill site for winter. Because come February, there are no more flights in or out of the South Pole because temperatures drop so low there that jet fuel can freeze. On my way back to the States, I got to see my favorite animal, a penguin, uh, but just one and from really, really far away. Once I got back to UC Irvine, the fun actually really begins. The ice cores we drilled at the South Pole had been shipped by boat back to the United States and then driven by refrigerated trucks to the National Science Foundation's ice core facility, which is located outside of Denver, Colorado. These ice cores arrived into the, to the ice core facility in late March. Um, and in June, I headed back to the ice core facility to work on what we call the core processing line. This multi-week long event consists of many scientists and helpers working in a walk-in freezer for roughly eight hours a day. You can see the temperature of the freezer here in this figure. Several research laboratories collect samples from the ice cores and ship these samples back to their respective labs to do their analysis. My job was to oversee the gas samples. So we have our big ice core and we're only taking small samples from it. So overall, I cut thousands, and yes, I mean thousands of samples, packaged them up and sent them all to the different laboratories that requested them. At UC Irvine, we actually ship our samples overnight by FedEx, so nothing super fancy, but we do ship them in insulated boxes with heavy duty ice packs. You can see the ice packs are the blue things in this, in this picture. And once safely tucked away inside our freezers and our lab, then I can actually do the research uh, that I set out to do. So my research was focused on understanding how wildfires changed in the past and what this could tell us about the future planet and the future Earth. To do this, I was looking at gases that are unique to wildfires in those ancient air bubbles. For each ice core sample, I worked in a walk-in freezer to prepare the ice for analysis. And then once prepped and ready to go, I loaded the ice into a chamber where then we would melt the ice and slowly release those trapped bubbles of ancient atmosphere. So in this video, we're watching an ice core sample melt. And this is always super mesmerizing to me. This sample is about 3,000 years old, and so we're literally watching and looking at air that is 3,000 years old. As the air bubbles escape the water and build up in the glass chamber, we can then collect that air and analyze it for the abundance of different gases. So once the ice has been completely melted, the collected air is analyzed using some instruments that kind of have complicated names, but they do two simple things. Gas chromato uh, chromatograph or gas chromatography separates out the air into the different gases we're interested to, in looking at. And then we have a mass spectrometer, which detects the amount of each of those different gases. So on any given day, I could prep, melt, and analyze at most two individual ice core samples. So after many months and quite frankly, many years of work, we finally can create a history of the different gases in the atmosphere. So here is a record of the gas that is going to tell us about wildfires. This gas is called acetylene. So the top points here show the abundance of this gas over Greenland for the last 2,000 years, measured in Greenland ice cores. And then the bottom shows the abundance over Antarctica, measured in Antarctic ice cores. And so to orient ourselves, this unit of measurement uh, in time is calendar year. Uh, so today, year 2020, is going to be over here on the right. And so we're looking at 2,000 years, 2,000 years being on the uh, far left here. And so the unit of measurement for acetylene is what we call a part per trillion. So for every million molecules of air, we were only measuring between about 20 and 120 molecules of acetylene. But if we focus just now on the Antarctic record, I've zoomed in, there's actually some interesting things that we observe. First, we see that the acetylene levels are high for about 1500 years and then decline quickly starting around 1500 CE. So I've highlighted what the climate was like during these two different periods. Here in the reddish color, the climate was actually warmer during the time period known as the medieval warm period. And this is when we saw more acetylene, 
and this means there had to have been more fires. The climate cooled a bit during the Little Ice Age, during the Blue Period here, and there was less acetylene over Antarctica, which means there had to have been less fires. And if we use some computer models, we actually can find that the variability in acetylene uh, was due to tropical wildfires decreasing during this 1500 period. So the big picture question here from this research is what does this mean for our future planet? Well, global temperatures are increasing at a rapid rate, and it's obvious from the ice core records that the wildfires are somehow linked to temperature, kind of in a positive way, meaning when temperatures get warmer, we see more fires. We can speculate that wildfires are going to become more frequent and more intense, as been observed over the past few years in California, Oregon, Colorado, where I live now, Australia, and elsewhere around the world. So we can look at the past to help us predict the future, but what is important to remember is that there's one big difference between a thousand years ago and today, and that is people. There are billions of people on this planet, and predicting how humans will behave is chaotic. What will happen to our planet in the coming decades and centuries depends on our actions now. So what have I learned through all of this? Well, first and foremost, always do what makes you happy and what interests you. The origins of our interests begin as children. So now I ask you, what do you wanna be when you grow up? All right, that was a really great adventure and also really amazing insight, Dr. Neiswanger, thank you. Um, and now it's time for some Q&A. So again, feel free to submit any questions into the chat bar and we'll put them up on the screen. Um, but just to start out with, I was just curious, um, what, was, what were the people like you were hanging out with in Antarctica and what other activities did you do in your spare time? Not that it sounds like you had very much spare time. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a great question. So the station has about 150 people. That's the capacity of the station. Um, and I would say really only maybe 45 to 40%, 40 percent, uh, 40 to 45 percent of those people are scientists, and the rest are people that maintain the station. So we have, you know, chefs and people working in the galley or the, the kitchen. Then we have um, heavy machinists, right? So we have people that know how to use the big tractors and things to help us move our equipment around. There's plumbers and electricians and carpenters. And so when I say these people are coming from diverse backgrounds, they really are. Um, some people understand climate change, some people don't. And so a lot of times at dinner, it's just mingling with people and informing them why we're down there and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, in terms of other things I did in my spare time, um, I watched a lot of the Big Bang Theory uh, <laughs> because they had all of the seasons on DVD. Um, and yeah, I mean, volleyball was really it. Uh, and, you know, sleeping when I could get the opportunity. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so Chili Willie says, did you use carbon to date the ice? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do not use carbon to date the ice. We actually um, can count the layers in the ice. So similar to how a tree ring has unique layers each year as the tree grows, you can actually visually see layers in the ice. Um, and there's also other ways, um, sorry, my cats are freaking out. <laughs> there are other ways um, that we can date the ice. We can look at volcanic signatures. So when a volcanic eruption happens, it releases different chemicals into the atmosphere, which act to acidify the atmosphere. And so if we run electrical current over the ice core, we can actually see when the ice becomes more acidic or less acidic. And we can actually use the volcanic uh, layers as a, a method to date the ice. And honestly, I could probably talk for another 15 minutes about how we date the ice, but the main way is that we actually count the individual layers. That's super cool. So fascinating. I also love that video of the air bubbles coming out. That was awesome. Okay, so uh, Zinal Patel says, how do all the buildings in the Antarctic have so much energy to keep warm? Yeah, and so this is actually kind of 
part of a trade-off that we have to do as scientists is we are using fossil fuel, unfortunately, to power the buildings. So all of the buildings in Antarctica, at least the South Pole Station right now, is warmed by generators. Um, and, and those generators use jet fuel that is brought in by the planes that uh, land there. So anytime a plane comes in, they offload some fuel and they leave enough fuel on the plane to get it back to where it was coming from. Uh, but unfortunately, we do use fossil fuels. Uh, maybe one day the technology will be there that we can have cool solar pa uh, panels and cool wind turbines at the South Pole. But one thing we have to think about is the South Pole is super cold um, and that really impacts electronics and all types of infrastructure. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. It's something that you probably don't think about when you're going down there or just the average person, you know, all of these logistics about how to make the whole entire thing work. It's really, yeah. really cool. Yeah. All right. So Melody H asks, what are some advice for students interested in research in the South Pole? Yeah, so there's many different ways to do it. So you can obviously go into research and, you know, I was talking about ice cores, but the South Pole is an amazing place for what Maggie had talked about, looking at our galaxy. So uh, the air is really dry there, so you don't get interference between water vapor and space. So you can look at you know, galaxies. There's a huge telescope down there. So if you're into physics, there's a lot of physical observations down there. Um, yeah, there's multiple ways. The main way is obviously doing research. But there's also, like I said, all the people that work there. So if you want to take a year off after you graduate college, I actually knew like 10 people that were there doing that. You get paid to work down there. You get room and board. You get food. Um, and it's a really cool experience. Yeah, it sounds like it. I think it would be fascinating just to live in such a different place for a year, doing whatever, yeah. really, honestly. All right. So TEDxCCR asks, what, are your best me what was your best memory spent in Antarctica? Oh, there's so many good memories. I just think it is kind of getting away from the world. It's kind of weird, but we didn't have a lot of internet. I didn't have a cell phone. I mean, I have a cell phone. It wasn't working. There's no internet down there. There's no cell phone service. We were always a little bit delayed in finding out news. Um, and so it was kind of nice to check out and just learn to talk to people and like not sit on my phone and scroll through Twitter or Facebook, whatever it is. Um, yeah, and just really get to talk to people and know people and understand where they're coming from and just not be immersed in my technology. So that was the, the, the best memory of Antarctica. Awesome, okay. So last question, um, Jen Campos Ayala asks, you have achieved a lot and have dedicated a lot of time into giving back and educating others in many capacities. How do you do it all? Hi, Jen. Jen is a student, a graduate student who took over my research at UCI. So she needs to be proud of herself as well. Um, my philosophy is that people helped me get where I am today. Uh, right. I was a first generation student. I no one in my family, you know, even now they still maybe don't know what I do. I see my brother is on the chat. So he's watching. But um, it's kind of your duty, right, to give back to people that have helped you and to make sure it's easier for other people to make it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I, I think another thing that's important to remember is that all of the work we're doing is paid by taxpayers. And so it's very important that we let people know what we're doing and why we're doing it um, because it's their contribution as, just as much as it is mine. Um, so that's how I do it all. I think that's a fantastic point. And we actually have one more question. So um, DJ Modisette asks, what is or was it jarring coming back after taking that leave from the real world? Yeah, and that's a great question. And I'm going to say yes, because one thing I didn't mention either is that it's really, really quiet at the South Pole, right? We only have one or two planes that may be coming in every day. Even then, they didn't come in every day. There was issues with weather. 
So you don't have somebody blowing leaves down the street. <laughs> Since I've been working from home, I realize just how much noise there is in our daily lives, the dog barking next door. Um, you don't have that. And so when I came back, I flew back into New Zealand to make my way back. And just like hearing people's phones vibrating and like all of the noise that we didn't have was really kind of jarring. And also a lot of things happened while I was at the South Pole. So there were, you know, police shootings of black men in America. I wasn't really tuned into that. So I came back to a world uh, that was changing and that was different. Um, but yeah, so it took a, a while to adjust to the new world. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, all right, so that is all that we have for Q&A. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nicewanger, for your time today yeah, and a great you, presentation. Uh, before our next speaker, we will have a short message from our last sponsor, Internet. Hey TEDx Riverside, it's me, Lauren Berger, your friendly intern queen. I'm so excited to be working with you all on this. That's my baby in the background, don't mind her, but I wanna make sure that you guys all know that you can follow Intern Queen at Intern Queen on Instagram, YouTube. You can check out internqueen.com and get in our network because we have paid college ambassador programs. We have paid internship programs all on our site. So shoot me a DM, that's your challenge. Get out your phone, go to at Intern Queen. Shoot Tell me you saw me at TEDx at UC Riverside. You want more info and we're gonna send you a link to get you in our database so that every time we have an opportunity, you get a notification. Now is the time to be resourceful, to be creative, to learn how to pivot and, uh, and everything we do is free. So hope we can uh, connect again soon and have a great event. Thank you, Intern Queen. You can visit them at their website at internqueen.com. Now we'll move on to the last speaker of our event, Stephanie Fine Sassy. Stephanie runs the Plenary Co a nonprofit that engages with the public in social and scientific issues. Stephanie's talk today has been pre-recorded, so there will be no Q&A for this portion. Without further ado, here is Stephanie. I spent the better part of a decade studying brains. I was trained in neuroscience and psychology research, first at OHSU and then at Harvard University. And often when I would tell people what I did, they would say something along the lines of, oh, that's cool. I'm not really much of a science person. And I would think about that all the time, not a science person. So what is a science person? We have these stereotypes and caricatures that are so limiting and one-dimensional in our society, and they leave most of us out. Science is presented as this world of white male genius types that work in isolation in elite institutions, and they alone can uncover the secrets of the universe. But in reality, science is collaborative and creative and dynamic. Science is a tool not a personality trait. And it's a tool that anyone can use to solve problems, to uncover truths, and to drive innovation. Science is just curiosity, but with a strategic plan. And its fingerprints are everywhere. When you look around your house, when you look at your ballots, when you look at your entertainment, or the justice system, or our collective response to a global pandemic, it's all either shaped by science of some sort, or should be. Science definitely does not have all of the answers, and it's 
not enough on its own, but it is one part of every serious conversation that we need to have about what progress could look like. And those same people that claim that they're not a science person probably do science every day. In one way or another, maybe they like to whip new things up in the kitchen or help their garden to grow or fix their own car. I mean, show me one parent that doesn't immediately become an amateur scientist as soon as their kid is born, trying to figure out how best to meet their needs or diagnose their runny noses. The truth is that we all use the fruits of science and we're all impacted by the forces of science, whether they're good or bad. And we all put science to work when we really care about something, even if we don't realize that that's what we're doing. So when I hear someone say, I'm not a science person, what I really hear is, I've never thought about science that way, or I've never really connected to the people that I've seen doing science, or science has never been presented to me in a way that feels relevant to the things that I care about. And that's where the problem is. Science has an image problem. It has a communication problem, and more than anything, it has an engagement problem. Surveys have shown that many Americans are worried about how science might change their way of life, and more and more are reporting that they don't particularly trust scientists either. Scientific institutions bear the brunt of the blame for this. Historically, and even today, they've been exclusive, exploitative, and even oppressive forces in many communities. On top of that, scientists are not trained or incentivized to build mutually beneficial or collaborative relationships with the people who their work impacts. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that more and more people don't trust science. I mean, how do you trust something if you've never even been properly introduced? And I want to be really clear here. The goal is not for all of us to become walking scientific encyclopedias. We've got Google for that, and science is always evolving and changing anyway. But if science is going to continue to be such an active force in shaping our lives, then this is a relationship that we have to fix. If we want to build a more sustainable and inventive and equitable future, then we need voters to be as informed as possible. And we need everyone to advocate for thoughtful application of science and to be prepared to examine issues through a scientific lens and to hold scientific institutions accountable to the values and the priorities of our community. But we're not there yet. So 10 years ago, when I was still working in the lab, I set out to help solve this problem. And like any good scientist, my first step was to turn to the evidence. And the first thing I learned is that there is a science to science communication, and there is a whole field of study dedicated to understanding public engagement with science. And there's a whole other field of study focused on the relationships between science and society over time. So between all of that and everything we've learned from fields like neuroscience and psychology, learning sciences, and communication studies, we have a lot of information about what works and what doesn't. Unfortunately, the next thing that I learned was that most of it doesn't really get put to use. So I decided to co-create a framework based on all of the research that I could get my hands on. I wanted to turn those insights into a set of usable strategies that could help me put all of those decades of research into action. And then I started working with a team of experts from across the field that could co-create workshops and platforms and trainings and courses and all of the other things that you build when you want to make a difference. We did free science communication trainings at campuses nationwide, and we championed the importance of a balanced model between scientists and their broader communities. We piloted a forum for scientists and non-scientists to have conversations about new research that was relevant to the real world. But at some point, we realized that we are trying to fit a new-fashioned set of ideas into an old-fashioned system. We were limited by the norms and the forms that we were used to. So in 2016, I sat on a park bench with a friend of mine named Amber Floyd, who is an artist and an educator who is also very interested in the same kinds of problems that I am. We started talking about this 
struggles we face in trying to implement these principles given the constraints of the conventions. And at some point it dawned on us that we didn't actually have to. We could just create something new, something built from the ground up based on what we thought might actually work. And for our first act of empirically informed defiance, we built a team that wasn't just made up of scientists, that didn't just value science. We brought together educators and artists and designers and community advocates to co-create an experience that looked a little bit like everything that we'd learned. We called it It's Only Human, and it was an interactive exhibition on human bias and how all of our biases shape our respective and collective realities. And to design the show, we turned to the three most compelling principles from across all of those fields that study this stuff. Connection, exploration, and presentation. So let's start with connection. Whether or not you care is probably the best predictor for whether or not you engage. And that probably sounds very obvious, but it's not really the guiding sentiment in the way that science is put out into the world. We've created a system where science demands your trust and care on account of its presumed authority instead of its relationships. And that's part of what makes it so fallible. If history has shown us anything, it's that you can't just demand authority and expect people to go along with it forever. So step one is to build trust by building relationships. And that can look like a lot of different things. It can be centering members of the community you serve in the co-creation of tools and resources. It can mean creating a wider range of relatable access points through things like storytelling and art. It can also mean making sure that the voices that are being amplified are representative of the people that are listening. For example, one recent study found that you can shift students' perceptions of their own scientific identities just by having them reflect on stories of scientists that break the stereotype. And in that study, those same shifts correlated with a greater interest in science and even better grades in science classes. So for our show, we wanted to build in connection and relevance at every level that we could. We used story and art to present knowledge in ways that felt accessible to more people because more people were represented in the content. When you walked into the space, it felt co-owned and co-created because it was. And the space itself was designed to create a sense of belonging. We had food and drinks and music, and it was all about humanizing the experience and synthesizing the different ways of knowing and connecting the dots between the information and our participants' everyday lives. I think some scientists are a little hesitant to open up scientific conversations to include more voices, in part because of how prevalent misinformation is. And misinformation is a major problem, but there's a big difference between misinformation and different lenses. And with a little effort, we can tell them apart. The reality is that knowledge building has to be a team effort. Responsibly including more ideas, more perspectives, and more forms of expression isn't going to dilute the truth. It's going to enhance our picture of it. And it's going to give a lot more people a sense of belonging along the way. Focusing on relationships and connection and relevance isn't more work, it's just different work. And in the long run, it's better for engagement and it's better for science. Which brings me to principle number two, exploration. Think about where you currently go to learn about any kind of science. My guess is that whatever comes to mind follows a pretty simple formula. Some content was created and you consumed it. That's the way most information flows through our society. There are the people who know things and they tell people who don't, whether through books or articles or podcasts or documentaries. If you're lucky, maybe you've got some cool interactive museums in your area, but even then that's probably not where you're going for the most up-to-date information. And the problem is that this passive style of learning that we've come to think of as the default isn't really how we learn best especially as adults. It works fine for topics that aren't particularly controversial or that you're already invested in. But science often gets wrapped up in political issues that can be quite polarizing. And 
by the time we're adults, we're already carrying all sorts of assumptions and biases and beliefs and identities with us everywhere we go and in everything we read. So if we're going to engage with science that's timely and relevant to current issues, in many cases, it's not just about learning. It's about changing our minds, or at the very least, about keeping an open mind. This whole idea that we should just have scientists come in and fill us up with knowledge has actually been pretty widely debunked by the fields that study it. It's called the deficit model. And basically, it assumes that the way we get to a scientifically literate or engaged society is just to make sure that facts and skills are taught to the public. But that doesn't work. Not for science knowledge and not for science literacy. So if having more all-knowing talking heads and lab codes isn't gonna fix our relationship with science, then what will? Well, the research suggests that active participation and experiential learning is a good start. For decades, research and have found that interactivity and autonomy and multiple modes of engagement can increase things like motivation to learn or our openness to new ideas or our ability to connect content to our real world situations. So we need to create environments that are exciting to explore, that tap into people's curiosity and imagination, not just their attachments and social groups. We need to create ways of learning that put people at the center, not experts at the center, and that give people opportunities to experiment and to find things out for themselves. At the It's Only Human show, we did this by creating 25 exhibits that we made multi-sensory and interactive. We implanted false memories in people, which is shockingly easy. And we, showered, we showcased powerful artworks that shed new light on scientific ideas. We had live volunteers there to play games, to demonstrate confirmation bias in tangible ways. And we put participants in simulations where they could test the consequences of their own assumptions. One of the attendees described it as like being in a book that you were the main character. And if you're the main character, you're a lot more likely to go on the journey. Finally, principle number three, presentation. The human brain is a quirky little thing. It is built on heuristics and pattern seeking and that plus the cues in our environment can have way more of an impact on the way we think than you might expect. At the plenary, which is the nonprofit behind the show, we have a saying, the opposite of bias is not objectivity, it's chaos. Because as soon as you start structuring any information, you're introducing some sort of bias. That information now looks a particular way because of choices that you made. And those choices might look a little bit different than the way I would have structured it. And so the way we organize things matters and the way we frame things can be a powerful tool. And the pathways that we create through and to knowledge can completely change the way it's received. Luckily, marketing and communication research is way ahead of us on this. Researchers have found that something as simple as what order an option is presented in can impact how likely we are to choose it. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. The evidence that's out there gives us tons of clues about how to frame and organize information so that it's more accessible, more engaging, or more likely to stick. There are ways to think with the grain of the human mind, to recognize our quirks in the way we design and to keep them in mind by using the right heuristics or creating the right pathways through knowledge. We know that metaphors can go a long way. We also know that too much jargon is the fastest way to see eyes glaze over. We know that scaffolding information can be a powerful way to layer concepts and that repetition and rhyming work wonders. And that humor and lighthearted examples can lay the foundation for more complex and challenging ideas. So that's how we structured It's Only Human. We knew that human bias was a bold topic choice because it turns out a lot of people come into a conversation about bias with a lot of biases of their own. So instead of starting with the heavy hitters, we started with optical illusions. They served as both a metaphor and an entry point. We got people comfortable with the idea that their mind is constantly filtering information and interacting with the world to construct their reality. That what they see isn't necessarily what is. 
it was fun and it was silly and it was low stakes and no one's really offended when you tell them that that gold dress is actually blue or at least not most people so then we move towards the more important personal biases like confirmation bias or motivated reasoning and it wasn't until the end that we got into complex social biases like racism sexism and the perpetuation of power hierarchy by the time participants got there though they were more open and prepared for that conversation we saw all this planning come together at the show and we had people from all walks of life attend many of whom were from the neighborhood and one guy in particular a local firefighter came and chatted with us a lot while we were setting up the show at the beginning of those conversations he said those magic words i'm not really much of a science so instead, we talked to him about the art and about the music and about the drinks and the food. We got him interested. And so we got him tickets. He showed up and I saw him walking around and reading every word, engaging with every exhibit. And at the end, he came up to my team and me and said, I don't understand how I got to my 40s and no one's ever told me this stuff about my brain. And then he said my personal favorite sentence of all time. I need to rethink some things. Now, I realized that it probably wasn't actually the first time that he's heard about bias. And it probably wasn't actually the first time that he's been exposed to these ideas. But there's a really big difference between exposure and engagement. And maybe this was the first time that it was presented to him in a way that he could really connect with. And the most amazing part is that he came back again the next day with his kids. He walked them around pointing at every exhibit and laughing about how the brains were broken. And then he came back a third time that night with his fiance and some of the firefighter friends. And all of a sudden, he was reaching out to engage members of his community in a way that I never could. He went from not a science person to a science advocate. And importantly, nothing fundamental about him changed. What changed was the way that science was offered to him. The environment and the content was aligned with the science of how scientific engagement could work. Connection, exploration, and presentation. Science has given us a roadmap for how to fix our relationship with science. We just have to decide to use it. Because at the end of the day, we are all science people in one way or another. We're all curious. We're all driven to better understand the world around us. And we're all driven to use what we know to solve the problems that we care about. If as a society, we want to navigate issues like sustainability and justice and automation and public health, then we need an informed and engaged public that cares about science. Science cannot fix the world's problems on its own, and frankly, it shouldn't try. We need to collaborate. We need to work with art and history and design and traditional knowledge and community insights. And we also need to start by using what we already know works, by being fearless in throwing out norms and giving ourselves permission to dream up entirely new possibilities, and by changing what it means to be a scientist. Thank you. Thank you again, Stephanie. With that being our last speaker, this concludes our event, Origins, Narratives of Discovery. Thank you again to the speakers for speaking at our event today. We thank all the viewers for taking the time to attend this event. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to work alongside all the students at TEDxECR and all of today's speakers to put on this event. I hope it has inspired all of you in some way. Thank you all for attending this event. We hope you learned something new. Nice Longer and Stephanie Fine Sass for sharing their experiences. I wanna thank Mad Madison and her SciComm team for helping us host a great event. Her team works tirelessly with us throughout these few weeks. I would also like to thank my team. Without them, this event would not have been possible. Their tireless hard work, determination, and skill set is what has kept our organization floating. And we wouldn't be here speakers. So thank you. TEDxUCR wishes you all the best for the future, and we hope to see you soon.
Goodbye.